So when I say the word reptile, what you're probably envisioning is some sort of lepidosaur. Now, we talked about the turtles and how distinctive they are and how anyone in the world could recognize a turtle. But at this point, you're probably wondering to yourself, what the hell is a lepidosaur? But before we get into that, let's talk about how humans and reptiles interact with each other. Let's use the example that people think of. Snakes. A snake in Greek uh, is known as uh, ophidi or ophidi. And ophidiophobia is something that humans have. It's a shared cultural trait around the world. Doesn't matter if you're from a place with venomous snakes or not. So the question that I have, are humans born with this fear or is this something they develop through time and exposure to other humans? Well, it's a big question. It's a hard question to answer, but people have tried. Below is a graph showing two lines uh, across time in seconds and looking at the dilation of the pupils in response to images. And the images are located above. So think about this graph right here. How do you think this experiment went down? What do you think the method was they were trying to figure out and what do you think they found and maybe think about the sort of controls they would have to use to study something like this I'll give you a hint it has to do with ophidiophobia Well, let's start with the mechanics of the graph. The dilation of the pupils is a hallmark of undergoing a fight or flight response or a stress response. So when the pupils are dilated, you're undergoing stress. So this is looking at the change in the dilation of pupils in response to images. And you can tell from the images above that the images are either of a snake or a fish with the, the hope being that people aren't afraid of fish. And you're looking at the time in seconds after exposure to these different pictures. So what was the main result of this study? Well, you can see that the line for the snakes in the red, that dilation in the pupils seems to happen faster following exposure of uh, the subject to an image of a snake. So what are some of the controls that you would need to engage in this sort of, um, for lack of a better word, zoological psychology experiment? Well, obviously you notice the different colors of fish, the different colors of snakes. A green fish is kind of a stretch, but they're out there. You can see how they've tried to control for the color, right? Because possibly you may re be reacting to a color more than anything else. So assuming this was something they had to control. Some other controls they might have needed were to expose the subject to the image for a particular set amount of time and not vary that between subjects. And under the same conditions, in the same room, and possibly in the same order or in different orders right uh, in terms of the number of snake images in a row versus the number of fish images in a row something like that now what's interesting about this graph is that you probably saw this and automatically assumed that the subjects were human beings but they weren't this was actually a study done on rhesus macaques rhesus macaques are monkeys 
and they are monkeys, and therefore the same type of creature that we are. So we're trying to extrapolate from monkeys to us. Now, monkeys live in a world that's tropical, where they do get exposed to the potential dangers of a snake bite. But so do humans, right? So the idea is that they're looking at this in captive bred monkeys to see whether or not this is a fear that's innate. Now, this has been done in humans, and the same results have been found. There seems to be an innate fear that primates have with respect to snakes. And the reasons are pretty obvious, right? The snakes do account for a quite a substantial number of injuries and deaths uh, around the world. India alone accounts for about 50% of snake bite deaths worldwide. Most snake bites can boil down, snake bite deaths can boil down to about five or six species that poses sort of what the World Health Organization describes as an epidemic. And as landscape uses change around the tropics, development, urbanization, all the same things that happen here, it increases this human wildlife conflict, right? And increases the, the uh, intensity of the interactions between humans and snakes. Now, snakes may be dangerous, some of them anyway, but they only represent one of the many types of lepidosaurs. So when we talk about lepidosaurs, we're talking about uh, non-avian reptiles, and we'll get to birds later, but we're talking about uh, the main reptile group that doesn't include birds, and it doesn't include turtles or crocodiles and, and alligators and things like that. And we can basically describe lepidosaurs in two broad camps. The rhynchocephalids, which uh, are the sphenodonts, or the tuataras, which are a group of special reptiles that once were quite abundant around the Gondwana land, but now they're pretty much restricted to New Zealand. We'll talk about them in a bit. And then what we're more familiar with, uh, the group, the squamates. The squamates include not only the snakes or serpents, but uh, lizards, the saria, as well as this quite interesting group called the amphibianids. So those three together make up the squamates, which is distinguished from the, the uh, rhynchocephalids, their own thing. None of these groups represent what amniotes look like a long time ago. We don't know what they look like. Just like the same thing we can be said about the, the ancestor of the turtle, we don't have the ancestor of these group either. Okay, so enough beating around the bush. What is a lepidosaur? Well, a lepidosaur is defined by three primary characteristics. The first is they have scales, right? The scales are uh, made from uh, osteoderms, right? So we're talking about small little sections of ossified bone that um, are covered by keratin, this, the uh, scale, and they're arranged in this overlapping sort of brigadine armor kind of way, right? These are embedded in the epidermis and they're underlying and they're rooted in the dermal layer, meaning that they, they basically go quite deep. And in doing so, they obviously provide uh, not only protection, physical protection, but they're also a form of waterproofing, uh, forming an impenetrable layer between the environment and the inside of the animal. Some really cool examples of these osteoderms, by the way, Gila monsters, which are a, a species of lizard in the southwestern United States, have these really cool skulls where half of the head is is got these really cool osteoderms. They form this cool little pattern. Just throwing that out there. The second trait is they have a cloaca, but unlike the cloaca of an amphibian, which runs longitudinally and it runs along the axis of the body, the cloaca in a lepidosaur is transverse. It's not, it's not vertical, but instead horizontal across the body. So there's a picture here showing a newt in the, in the water, and you can see the cloaca kind of like a little slit. In lepidosaurs, it's running across the body. So a fairly easy characteristic. And then the third defining trait of the lepidosaurs, the third apomorphy of a lepidosaur, is that they do shed their epidermis in a periodic fashion. Right. So we all know about snake shedding. But lizards shed too. It just doesn't come out as one big thing like snakes, so it's not as well known. Why do these animals have to shed? 
Well, it has to do with growth. They're growing these osteoderms. They're not very flexible. Once these osteoderms are ossified, they become hardened and they stay. As a snake or any other animal gets larger, it's going to essentially be tightened by its skin and it will have to shed as a result. So that epidermal layer gets shed with the new layer growing underneath it. So let's start with the sphenodonts or the tuataras. The tuataras uh, stands for spineback in Maori. Uh, Maori language is um, originated in um, by the tribal peoples that inhabited New Zealand. New Zealand is uh, essentially, as you know, it's an island nation. It's actually two islands, a North and South Island, as well as a bunch of other little neighboring islands, all of which make up the country of New Zealand. And that North Island is basically home to the Tuatara, right? And they used to be in the South Island as well, but I believe there's only a few little populations of them, of them there. As of right now, there's a little bit of debate, but they're essentially recognizing the quote-unquote mainland version, which inhabits the North Island. And then in another distinct species of Tuatara that inhabits a neighboring island, a small one called Brother Island, which phenotypically looks a little bit different. Now, there's a lot of debate because anytime you have a type of animal that's trapped on a small island, it almost always is going to take on different characteristics than the parent population on the mainland. So the degree to which that represents a species is a lot of debate. But of these two species that are alive today, they represent the survivors of a vast group of animals that existed during the Mesozoic era. So this was 220 million years ago uh, when it started, and this was the time of the dinosaurs. So during the time of the dinosaurs, uh, there were these Tuataras all around, all around uh, Gondwana that were running around and doing things, right? Uh, at the foot of the dinosaurs because they never got as big. So what are some of the characteristics of Tuataras? Well, they got the two temporal fenestrations, and that would make them a... Yeah, hopefully you guessed it, a diapsid, right? So they are a diapsid. They're the classic example of, a, of, a, of an ancestral diastrid with the two large temporal fenestrations behind their eye. They have teeth that are acrodont, if you recall what that means. Well, acro means edge, so it's those teeth that were essentially just attached to, to the uh, bone with no sort of root. So they don't have a, they don't have a, a tooth socket like mammalian teeth do. So acrodont teeth, these varied in shape. So the ones in the front of the jaw would look pretty different, distinct from the ones in the back of the jaw. So we call this condition heterodonty, right? So they're, they exhibit a heterodont condition. And speaking of teeth, their arrangement is quite interesting. They have two rows of teeth at the top. So not only do they have front teeth, back teeth, but they also have a, one row of front teeth and one row of back, you know, uh, teeth behind that row. So you have these two, these two rows of teeth in the upper jaw, and then you have one row of teeth in the lower jaw. So when they close, when the mouth closes, that lower jaw teeth is going to fit right in between the, the teeth on the upper jaw. And what that does is it provides this, this uh, excellent way of cutting, right, of shearing things, which goes along with their diet. These are primarily carnivorous animals, right, eating basically whatever they can, they can catch. Uh, they also have uh, rudimentary copulatory organs, meaning that they have a, sort of, uh, a, you know, a penis and, and, uh, for internal fertilization that is pretty consistent with some of the amphibians we've talked about. Uh, and then the other thing is they have um, ears, but they're not, they're simply a hole, like a pore in the side of the head, as opposed to external ears. Right? So not too different from a turtle, let's say. But what's interesting about Tuataras for me is where they live, because New Zealand Although it's a you know cool exotic place for most people, is still a cold place 
Uh, it's not a tropical paradise by any stretch of the imagination. It's a cold place. It's closest to Antarctica than any other nation, with the exception of possibly Chile and Argentina. So they live in a place that's cold, and the temperatures can get pretty cold, and they're also nocturnal, meaning that they are exposed to temperatures that are quite, quite low, and they take, you know, they're active during the coldest time of the day, and they spend their day basking and recovering some of that body heat. And they live in places uh, along the coast, often in within seabird colonies, uh, which is both good and bad because it's a ready source of food for the Tuataras, but, you know, it means the seabirds have to deal with this constant predator uh, hanging around or potential predator, right? They're eating their eggs and stuff like that. Now, the thing about these Tuataras is in terms of reproduction, they're definitely a relic of an age before humans because it takes them a long time to reach sexual maturity. And then when they do, it can often take several years in between nesting attempts. So while this happens, you know, they have a very low capacity to recover their population once their population starts to dwindle. Another characteristic of these guys is they exhibit that TDSD, that temperature-dependent sex determination, which we saw earlier with the turtles. And they prefer to incubate their eggs at a temperature that's typically considerably lower than you would see for a turtle or any other kind of reptile. And just to give you another indication of how slow reproduction is, they will lay an egg and it can take up to one year to even hatch that egg because at those lower temperatures, metabolism and everything is a lot slower. So slower temperatures takes a long time to reach sexual maturity and they don't even breed every year, especially if it takes you a whole year to raise an egg. Well, that's a recipe for disaster when it comes to humans being involved. So here is a graph showing temperature-based sex determination. You've seen this type of graph before showing the sex ratio and the proportion of males as a function of temperatures. And what do you notice? And more specifically, how is climate change going to impact this? Well, you probably guessed, right? The warmer the temperature, the more males you get in your population. And these are two different graphs showing the two different species. Gunther being the um, primarily the, the the one from the, the mainland, the, the more common of the two, and the punctatus being the one from Brother Island, that smaller population. And uh, you would imagine that, well, if warmer temperatures are producing more males, then you would accept that as time goes on and temperatures start to increase, especially in a place like New Zealand, which is located near the poles, they're seeing greater rates of warming than the rest of the world. Well, you would expect there to be an increasing population of, of males over time. And that is actually what you do see when you do counts, when you actually look at abundance, you're seeing more males in a population than you do females over the last few decades. So this is data going up to 2012, but nothing's really changed at this point. I couldn't find anything more, more accurate, more recent than this. No, not accurate, recent. Okay, while well, the tuataras, the sphenodonts, the rhicocephalids, whatever you want to call them, are obscure to most people, the squamates most definitely aren't. In part because there are so many of them, so many versions about 7,000 species or so, probably an underestimate, especially as time goes on, we're finding new species all the time. Squamates, unlike turtles and crocodiles, exhibit determinant growth, which is not that different from what we experience. And basically the idea behind determinant growth is you're going to continue to grow up until a certain point, in which case growth starts to slow down. You can only get so big as a lizard. You can only get so big as a mammal. Turtles and crocodiles, on the other hand, seem to have indeterminate growth, meaning that as long as they stay alive, they can continue to get larger and larger and larger, whether in overall size or weight. You don't see this with squamates, so lizards and snakes don't experience this. Another characteristic of squamates, they have paired copulatory organs called hemipenes. So they literally stick out like a, like a Y outside of the cloaca. 
quite a thing to see, actually. So it's a sort of a two-pronged uh, male copulatory organ, a two-pronged penis, if you will. I know it sounds terrifying. Um, other things that uh, squamates have, not all species have these, but uh, a vomeronasal organ that is specifically designed to test to detect pheromones. All right. So there's a lot of pheromonal communication going on in squamates. Some species uh, of lizards, for example, will produce femoral pores or have femoral pores that produce pheromones. So quick question, how is a pheromone different from a hormone? Well, they're basically the same thing, except that one is designed to circulate through the body and serve as a signaling molecule from one organ to another, so it's circulating through the blood, whereas pheromones are circulating usually through the air or through, through the water, through some other substance outside of the animal. So hormones are intra-animal, intra-individual communication, whereas pheromones are inter animal or inter-individual or inter-specific communication. So pheromones are chemicals that are secreted into the environment and they are then detected by, um, by the essentially olfactory sense of animals. In the case of squamates, they have this vomeral nasal organ. Every time a snake sticks out its tongue, it's actually taking chemicals out of the air that are that attach to its tongue and then sticking it in the vomeral nasal organ, which is located uh, right in front of the eyes of these guys. So they're actually detecting their environment that way. Much like a dog has a sense of smell, the same sort of thing happens with snakes, except that they use their tongue as opposed to just bringing in air through their nostrils. Same sort of thing. Now, a quick thing about these femoral pores. Femoral pores are uh, little pores located on the hind legs of animals, and they actually gave me my start in this whole crazy world of biology. So when I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto, the University of Toronto uh, had the Royal Ontario Museum, which was also located by the campus. All the stuff is downtown in Toronto. It's a big city. And I saw a volunteer opportunity to work in the herpetology department at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I was like, oh, I have to do this. So I, I applied and I got it. Turns out I was the only person that applied. So I don't know if that makes me a superstar or not. I don't think so. But um, I show up and it was Bob Murphy's lab. Bob Murphy, Robert Murphy was an interesting sort of eccentric kind of museum collector kind of guy. He was interested in genetics. He was interested in identifying new species of animals, which is a lot of what museums do. So I do a lot of like evolution work using molecular methods. And at the time, that was, you know, there was cool new things coming out. So I was like, okay, this is a great opportunity. I'm going to learn something. So I go in to talk to him about a project. And he wanted to talk to me about a project that he had. And he wanted me to be a part of it. And he told me about these fringe-toed lizards that lived in the southwest United States. So that's what a fringe-toed lizard looks like. And they're really, really cool-looking lizards. And they have these really large hind legs. And on their... On the toes of their hind legs, they have these fringes that allow them to run on the sand. And when you get scared, they'll just, you know, kind of do a quick little sprint and then they'll just jump into the sand. And you can usually find them because when they go into the sand, they leave an imprint on the sand. Now, the imprint on the sand is where the lizard jumped into it. It's actually further deep down. So if you look at that little mark right there where that, where that lizard went under, under the sand in these dunes, these sand dunes, the actual lizard would be right in front of that. So you would actually just reach out right in front of the thing and, and grab the lizard that way. And he wanted me to, to work on these. And I was excited because I was like, oh man, I could, maybe I'll do field work. I'll go down to New Mexico and Arizona, California, and Mexico. And I was excited, right? I get to go around sand dunes. I get to you know live out my Arabian desert fantasies, whatever it is I want to do. And then he tells me, okay, here are some museum specimens that we collected. I want you to count the number of femoral pores on each of these specimens. And there was like a whole room full of specimens. And that was it. 
And his idea was that each of these sand dune complexes are, dis are disconnected from each other. So there was a high probability that these fringe toed lizards, which lived in all these different sand dunes, have been isolated geographically from each other for a long, long time and thus have evolved into different species, right? Allopatric speciation. On the surface, they all look the same, but they might be genetically different enough, but the environment still makes them kind of similar. So they're what we call cryptic species. So your average non-professional wouldn't be able to tell these things apart by species. And the idea is that each dune had its own complex. So that's what he wanted me to do. There was no intention of ever going back out in the field. He already had the samples, didn't need to do any of that. So my first job in biology was counting these damn femoral pores. But I think about it nowadays, I'm like, well, you gotta start somewhere. So I did it, I did the best I could. I don't think I found anywhere near what he wanted me to find, but as far as those femoral pores go, the damn things got counted. And I'm proud of that. That was my first, my first thing that I did to completion. So let's talk about lizards. There are two major lineages. There are many different types of lizards, but by the Jurassic period, so Jurassic period, Jurassic Park, dinosaurs, you know. Um, by this point in time, there are two primary branches, and then there are many variants of that branch. So you have the iguanids on one hand, which tend to be um, slightly larger lizards. Their tongue is fleshy, kind of looks like a tortoise's tongue. And they're either, the largest ones tend to be herbivorous or they're sit and wait predators. Um, meaning they'll stay in one spot and wait for food to come to them. And then you have this other large group of lizards called the scleroglossas. And scleroglossa just means hard tongue. The tongue is, char is keratinized meaning that they're, they're um, less reliant on manipulating objects with their tongue and instead tend to be more the, the carnivorous type, the more chasing um, prey type of lizard. And they um, would rather use their jaws for breaking things open as opposed to manipulating things with their tongue. So the iguanids are one type of lizard. And then all the other type of lizards can be roughly categorized as scleroglossa. So here is a phylogenetic tree showing the relationships of all of the different lizards. Do you notice anything bizarre about this tree? Well, it looks like a typical phylogenetic tree. And as far as lizards go, there's all the different groups of lizards there, so what more do you want? Well, the weird thing is that the amphibianids and the snakes are also in the midst of all of this. So this leads to a very big issue in herpetology. And that issue is that lizards when you look at it in evolutionary time, when you look at the phylogenies, there's not really a grouping that you can say are lizards. Lizards aren't really a thing. There's different types of quote unquote lizards, but they're not necessarily related to each other in any particular way. So the 18 families that make up the lizards, quote unquote, represent either a polyphyletic grouping or a paraphyletic grouping, which as we know now, that's not what evolutionary biologists want. So what can we say about lizards? Smaller ones are insectivores, mostly. Larger ones are herbivores, mostly. There are exceptions in both. Uh, the one thing that does make a lot of lizards, don't you know, unifies them, is the fact that they're kind of the only vertebrate that tends to exhibit a high degree of tail auto autotonomy. And all that means is autotonomy means that they're uh, able to release their, their tail, right? And it's a defensive mechanism, right? You grab a lizard, if you grab it by the tail, there's a very good chance that that lizard will take off and you'll have a wiggling tail that's moving around because of nerve impulses that are just randomly firing off inside that tail, thus confusing the predator and leaving the actual animal alone. 
when these things break, the tail is always breaking along a sort of predetermined line where there's a growth plate with cartilage that allows that tail to be regrown. And the whole process of doing that is actually something that's always fascinated biologists and especially biomedically speaking, how do the cells know to become new tail tissue, new nervous tissue, new blood vessel tissue, those stem cells that are part of that cartilaginous plate? How do they know to do that? That gets a lot of people interested in um, can we regrow limbs, that sort of thing, right? Can we, can we engineer this? But I'm getting ahead of myself. What are some other things about lizards? Well, if they're living in places where they have to move through dense vegetation or underground fossorial uh, or in thick vegetation, their limbs might be a lot shorter. Their limbs tend to be longer in more open habitats. And then lizards also are one of the few reptiles where you can often tell the difference between males and females. They exhibit what we call sexual dimorphism. That's often not the case in most reptiles, some of which is involving color. So there's often very elaborate ornamentation on lizards. And here's an example. These are fence lizards from out west. Um, Scoloperous lizards, which are just western fence lizards. There's eastern fence lizards here as well. And the males underneath have this blue, iridescent blue coloration that the females lack. Interestingly enough, there are young females that often exhibit male-like behaviors. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And they'll often exhibit a, a phenotype that's somewhat in the middle. So you see here this male-like female has a little bit of blue showing. So it's a pretty interesting thing. And lizards uh, are actually quite a well-studied group uh, in the sense that a lot of people have done research on them because they're excellent models for understanding animal behavior, for understanding animal ecology, as well as for understanding animal physiology. And I've been lucky enough to be a part of that, right? Um, so here I am in, in Baja, Mexico, holding a, a chuckwalla. There I am in Arizona holding a Gila monster. I'm in Aruba there holding uh, an anole lizard. I'm in Borneo in Malaysia holding a uh, water monitor. These are all animals that I've worked on and animals that I find very fascinating because despite the fact that a lizard is a lizard and looks like a lizard, they, lizards act in very different ways. So I've always been interested in linking those behaviors with something physiological and that's often what I've done and I continue to do now. And if you're ever interested in doing this, I do study the lizards that run around here. So lizards are cool even though they're not a thing. Thus end of the lesson. Let's talk about these amphibianids. These are otherwise known as the worm lizards, but they're neither worm nor lizards. They look like a worm. They have rings around their body. They're annulate, meaning that they have these segments. And as you can imagine, if you're living underground and you're living in the dirt and you have this sort of body, people are going to confuse you with an earthworm, right? So we use the term fossorial to describe an animal that lives underground. Now, they're all carnivorous like most of the reptiles are. Uh, they're living underground, so it makes sense that they don't need their eyes, so they'd be reduced or even completely absent. They've also undergone other modifications of their body. For example, their, their lung, the right lung, is actually reduced to a small little bag, the left lung being the, large, the larger of the two lungs. Um, varying degrees of, of limbs being present, but for the most part, they don't have any limbs that are visible. They might have the, the skeleton, but they don't have them that are visible, with the exception of this very bizarre one in the middle here, uh, Bippies. And Bippies has four forearms like this, but it lacks the hind limbs. So this is a, the same photo I've seen a million times. And I remember seeing this as a kid in a book, and I thought to myself, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen, and I'd like to see one in the wild. I've never seen one in the wild, though. One interesting thing about this group of animals is how much very, very variety sorry, there is in their skull and the degree to which it's ossified. They're very, very ossified skulls, meaning that they're very, very thick bone, basically. Why do you think that would be an, uh, an advantage? Well, they're living underground and they don't have limbs which means that they're digging through the ground with their head. And having an ossified skull will help you move through that. 
Other thing about the skull that's bizarre is they have their mouth uh, is not the end of their their rostrum. So, you know, in a typical animal, you're going to have, you know, the, the snout and then the mouth is going to be kind of like at the end. In their case, they have it underneath. So think of something like a, like a ray or a, a skate or something like that, right? Where the mouth is kind of underneath the head. And it makes sense because you don't want to move through the dirt with your mouth full. The only exception being uh, pippies, again, which is of all of these animals, the least fossorial among them, which may explain why they still have their forearms. They also have three different types of um, heads, and there are many species, about you know less than 200 species of these things, but uh, there's three different types of, of skulls they can have. They could either have the very blunt sort of skull of like bippies, right? You can have a wedged shape skull where it's very, very narrow at the end, or you can have one that's got a keel, just kind of like, just like the keel on the bottom of a boat. It has a keel in the front. So what do you think might be the selection there for, for these different types of snouts on the skulls? Well, it has to do with what they're burying through. A wedge-shaped skull is very effective when you're dealing with loose sand, loose um, soil, softer. It's easier to just kind of scoop it out of your way, right? So you can kind of shovel it out of your way as you move through the layer. If you're dealing with a harder substance, you need to be able to cut through it with a little more blunt force. And that's why um, species that live in, in soils that have a lot of clay, which tends to be stickier and harder, will have uh, keeled skull shapes. So it has to do with that. And then the blunt ones tend to be ones that are a little less uh, burrowers than, than the others. Uh, another interesting characteristic of these guys is they have uh, a single, single tooth on their upper jaw and it fits in between their, their lower jaw which has two teeth. So they have this, this Essentially, they have this uh, extra tooth in their upper jaw that fits in between their two lower jaw teeth. So that's something that's usually not seen. Usually, uh, animals will tend to have uh, skulls with teeth that are essentially symmetrical, up and down, left and right. They're, they're the exception. They have this one central tooth in a, incisor in the middle. And they also can hear. They can hear by using their, their scales on their face that function in the same way as a tympanic membrane, but they don't have a true ear. Now, the most interesting thing about these animals, and the most bizarre thing about these animals, is that their skin is not connected to anything inside their body. So what does that mean? They're basically a tube within a tube. What I mean is you can take an animal like Bippies here, and you can completely turn its skin round and round and round, or you can take one of the other ones that don't have the arms and just wrap, you know, turn the skin round and round and round while holding all of their organs constant, right? So their skin is just a, a loose covering over your body that can turn around your body, their body at will. So think about if you're going camping and you're in a sleeping bag, for example, and if you've ever slept in a sleeping bag, you know that you wake up and the sleeping bag is all wrapped around in different ways. That's how they're living their life with this sleeping bag that they call a skin. Crazy. I think that's mind blowing. That's, that's mind numbing. And there are examples of amphibians being its here, and maybe we'll be lucky and see them on one of our trips. So let's get to how we started this whole thing. Snakes. Where did snakes come from? Well, snakes probably went underwent the same selective pressures that amphibians went to, in that they had to, to burrow in the ground and limbs became useless as a result. So they probably most likely evolved from a quote-unquote lizard uh, that had a particular fossorial lifestyle, right? Uh, so it was a burrowing lizard of some kind. And we like to identify uh, monitor lizards in particular because monitor lizards exhibit a lot of snake-like qualities, including the fact that they have a forked tongue, just like snakes do. So modern mon monitor lizards stick their tongue out just like a snakes do. Uh, lizards, other lizards don't. 
So probably something like this, something like Najash, which is here's a replica of what Najash would have looked like. But basically this, it's a, it's a long, thin monitor lizard. So monitors are lizards like um, Komodo dragon, for example, is sort of a monitor lizard. So you have uh, you know this animal that had very small limbs compared to the length of its body. And we've looked for, for other sort of fossilized animals, but it's been hard to find a lot of uh, fossil representatives of early ancestors of the snakes. But one in particular that's come up is uh, Hasiophis terrasanctus, which was found in Israel in Jerusalem. Uh, and it dates back pretty far into the Jurassic period, but there's only one fossil of it. But when you look closely, you'll see essentially a snake's body with small little limbs popping out of it. So here's some x-ray images showing those hind limbs popping out of the, uh, the side of the animal, right? So here's a fossil with tiny little limbs. Might have been one of the first to, to have evolved this sort of snake-like condition. So Hasiophis terrasinctus. Uh, you can kind of tell where it's found by the name. No? There's a lot in a name. Terrasinctus which means sacred ground. It's found in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a you know, holy city for all the Abrahamic religions, right? So Judaism, Christianity, as well as um, Islam. Uh, and all, so obviously the Holy Land, it's called that for a reason. So there you go, it's from the Holy Land. So the snakes, the serpents. Everyone knows what a snake looks like, although there are a lot of things that can look like a snake. Snakes have taken this general design and have run with it. 18 families, almost 3,000 species. They're found all over the world on every continent, uh, as well as the ocean, as shown by this map here. They're not in the Atlantic, in case you're curious, uh, but you do have sea snakes in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. So... This incredibly diverse, very monophyletic group, what are some of the characteristics? Well, there's obvious ones. Let's go through some of the, the less obvious ones. Obviously, they don't have limbs. They're long. Their uh, left lung is reduced, right? So it's the opposite of the, of the amphisbenids. Uh, or it might be entirely absent. They have one lung, basically. The gallbladder, which in mammals and other animals is sort of uh, closely aligned with the liver, is actually a separate organ and further away from the head than the, uh, the liver is. The intestines are not convoluted. They're just a straight shot down the middle of the animal. All of their organs are offset, meaning that they're, they're only on one side and off of the general axis of the body. So they're either on the left or the right side. They're not on both sides like they are with us. And if you look at the, snake, the scales on a snake, the upper scales are going to tend to be small, on the ventral side, so on the dorsal side, they're small, but on the belly side of the snake, they tend to be longer. We'll talk a little bit about what they're doing. So those are all body traits. And they also have some very uh, apomorphic derived traits in the head. They have a skull that has essentially reduced the amount of ossification to the point where there's very little skull there. And instead, They've invested in having ligaments that allow that skull to expand, right? Uh, the mandible, right, the jaw is essentially held on by ligaments, both sides of the jaw as well as the jaw to the rest of the skull. They also have uh, eyelids, but the eyelids are essentially, they're permanently closed. If you ever look at a snake, you can see its eyes. Well, that's because the eyelid is covering it but it's completely clear and transparent. So when they shed their skin, you can actually see a scale where the eye is supposed to be. Whenever you have a snake in captivity and it's about to shed, one of the things that give it away is the fact that its eye starts to get cloudy. It's actually the, the shed that's starting to thicken and become opaque that covers the eye. And they also have a vomeronasal organ, as we talked about, and they have a forked tongue. All snakes have a forked tongue, which they use to essentially sense the world around them. So a very interesting example of how a winning body design, just like the turtles, can, can allow you to become very, very successful as a vertebrate. So 
When it comes to snakes, there's basically three kinds. And we can separate these into like tribes or groups or whatever you want to call them. The first is the Scolecophidia. Scolecophidia just is blind snakes. We'll talk about them. It's this very specialized group. In many ways, they kind of represent what an ancestral snake would look like. Then you have the Heniophidia, which are sort of the, pri the primitive type of pythons and boas, animals that we're familiar with. And then everything else would be considered a Cenophidia, which accounts for the vast majority of um, uh, snake diversity, as well as uh, where all the venomous snakes come from. So we'll talk about each of these groups one by one. So first, let's start with this. So the Scolicophidia. These are the blind snakes. This is the ancestral lineage. When you look at um, sort of evolutionary speaking, they're small snakes. They live in the ground. They very much look like amphisbionids, sharing a lot of those same characteristics. Uh, reduction in teeth, eyes. Unlike them, though, they have the skin actually attached to their body. So you can't do that cool little trick that you can with rolling their skin around like a sleeping bag. Um, but they do have a lot of these shared characteristics. Uh, they don't have the annulate rings. Instead, they have scales um, that are you know, very snake-like. But other than that, they have a lot of those same characteristics, which would make them, relative to the amphisbenids, those structures would be considered... homologous traits, right? Um, when you look at their internal anatomy, they still have a pelvic girdle, suggesting that they've had limbs, evolutionary speaking, at some point, but no longer. Now, this is a, a, a group of snakes that's found all around the world, but they don't tend to be the more familiar of a type of snakes. Instead, we like to think of snakes like this. These are the Heniophidia. And the Heniophidia are basically your pythons, your boas, and an anaconda. Um, sounds, like a, sounds like a joke. Python, boa, and anaconda walk into a bar. What are the differences between these three types of snakes? And can you take any guess as to which one's which in the photos? Well, although superficially they look the same, there are some key differences. So, pythons uh, are considered, you know, pythons are essentially old world snakes, meaning they live in Asia, Africa, Australia, the old world, uh, as opposed to the new world snakes, which are going to be your boas and your anacondas. Anaconda is basically a really large boa. So boas and anacondas are kind of the same thing. Pythons, they're on their own. So you have the old world pythons and the new world anacondas and boas. On top of that, you also have some differences uh, in terms of the reproduction. So anacondas and boas both give live birth. They're viviparous, whereas pythons are oviparous, producing eggs, right? They have eggs in a nest. Now, other than that, they're pretty similar. They're all, you know, strong constrictor snakes. They can be very large. They're all uh, essentially ambush predators. And there's varying degrees of whether they live in the trees or whether they live underground, whether they live in wetland areas. So a lot of, they've occupied a lot of different habitats, but they're mostly, they're almost entirely restricted to the tropics. That said, uh, they do, some of these species still retain uh, some evidence of a pelvis that would suggest they had limbs, but most have lost them. Now, in terms of the images, well, that, that, that yellow one you see in the, in the picture, that black and yellow one close up on the left side of your screen, that's going to be an anaconda. That's a yellow anaconda, a species that's been found even in Florida as a feral. Another species that's more often been found in Florida as a feral, but as a common pet is the upper right part of your image. That is a boa constrictor. It's probably a Central American boa constrictor, a very common animal in the pet trade and a lot of people have. And then what's really been seen in Florida a lot are the Burmese pythons, which is what that lower right picture is showing you. A Burmese python um, obviously are a very major problem here in Florida, an invasive species. They've been associated with the collapse of a lot of animals uh, particularly animals that are 
what we call meso meso carnivores and meso herbivores in size um you know whether we're talking about raccoons possums animals of that size uh but they're big enough to even take on large alligators and stuff like that so they've been really roughing up everybody around here in florida and if in case you're curious they do have those roundups every every year that put on by the fish and wildlife the florida fish and wildlife commission uh, and they tend to be a bit of a, a tourist draw whenever they they go on they're hard to find though but maybe we'll get lucky one day now uh these snakes are primarily restricted to the tropics but all other snakes would fall into this Canophilia group. And the Canophilia group are these quote unquote advanced snakes. So most snakes you're going to encounter that are alive today belong in this group. And one family in particular is especially dominant and encompasses a huge range. And these are the colubrid snakes, so the members of the family Colubridae. In addition to these 3,000 or so snakes, they're discovering new ones every year. About 600 or so of these are going to be your venomous snakes. And your venomous snakes are going to come from one of four families. Your vipers, so it includes not only your tropical vipers, but also things like rattlesnakes uh, and copperheads and stuff like that. Your elapids, which include things like your crates and your mambas and your cobras. And then uh, stiletto snakes, which are a lot less known, but they're these really cool snakes that are really, really thin and they have fangs that protrude from the sides of their mouth. So they're actually very difficult to hold in the hand. Uh, and as a result, even the most expert herpetologists tend to get tagged by these. And then uh, you also have some members of the colubridae, which otherwise are mostly non-venomous, but you have a few representative examples that, uh, that can be venomous, uh, a lot of mildly venomous snakes, but some that can be quite, quite dangerous as well. One characteristic of these snakes is their skull is very quote unquote kinetic, meaning that they don't have a lot of bones, they have a lot of ligaments, and is kinetic in the sense that it can really stretch, which it has to do in order to accommodate uh, larger prey, right? So they could really, you know, they could dislocate their jaw, they can dislocate the, the front of their jaw, they can dislocate their jaw from their mandible, from the maxilla, and they're able to, to swallow large prey. And there's no remnant of a pelvic girdle in these animals. So here are some photos of some snakes. See if you can guess what they are. Some of them might be easier than others. Well, let's start from the top left. The top left snake that's looking right at the screen, black snake with a little bit of white, might be a species you've seen here on campus. That's a black racer snake. Uh, it's a very common non-venomous snake here in Florida. Another common non-venomous snake is the one right beside it to the right. That's a Florida banded water snake. So an example of one of the many water snakes that are often confused for a venomous animal, but again, non-venomous. Although being non-venomous doesn't necessarily mean they don't bite. Now right below that water snake is this white snake giving this really cool pose. That's actually a native uh, Florida pine snake, a uh, species that likes the upland sand hill environment. And uh, whenever you see one, it's a real treat. There's nothing else like it. It's such a beautiful snake. Right beside it is another white snake that has its mouth open. And if you look inside its mouth, it's black. This is one of the most dangerous and feared snakes out there. Many movies name their assassins after this thing. This is the black mamba. The black mamba has one of the most toxic venoms on the planet. You'll hear some statistic if you ever watch a documentary about how, you know, one bite from this has enough venom to kill 10 elephants or whatever. Um, they're very they're very venomous. We'll talk about venom in a little bit. They're also particularly aggressive when they're cornered, and they're also pretty long. So it makes for a very intimidating uh, and very fast animals. So it's a very scary thing to encounter one of these uh, when you're not expecting it. And unfortunately, they do make it into people's homes in places like South Africa where they're found. Below that is a even more dangerous but less often encountered species. Uh, that that blue and, and black bands, that is a sea snake. Uh, this is an Indo-Pacific sea snake. And they are highly venomous, but they're one of the few snakes that have adapted to the ocean. And 
They do come out to breed. They come out to breed on land, as you would expect, kind of like a sea turtle does, except they prefer rocky areas and not beaches. Uh, and for a brief period of time when they do come out, they're notorious for not being particularly aggressive. So people, even people that don't know what they're doing, will go ahead and free handle these snakes, um, thinking that they're not going to get bit, although it does occasionally happen. And if you get bit by one of these, there is no anti-venom, kind of like the black mamba. You don't have a lot of time. Below are two more venomous snakes. The one on the uh, left side of your screen obviously is a cobra. There's nothing more distinctive than a cobra. That is uh, the Egyptian cobra, I believe. Yeah, Egyptian cobra. It's got the blackened head, which is more characteristic of like the Western Sahara. So we're talking about places like, um, well, like Western Sahara, Algeria, uh, Morocco, places that are known as the Maghreb. When you go further east towards Egypt, it starts looking a little more tan in color, not so much black on the head. And then right beside it is a snake that is often feared here in Florida, and it's named for the fact that when it opens its mouth, it's bright white. That's the cotton mouth, a snake that people feel is aggressive, but really is not. Its defense mechanism is to coil around and open its mouth and let you know what it is. And at that point, I feel like unless you're you're messing with it, you shouldn't be getting bit at this point. But it is a snake that tends to, when it's in the water, tends to prefer to go on dry land to get away. And if it, if your boat happens to be the closest dry land, then it might make it its way for your, towards your boat. And that's what's given it the reputation of being aggressive and chasing people. But it's all nonsense, because that's what humans do. They come up with nonsense to explain animal behavior. So snakes move in a lot of different ways, and the ways they move is actually part of a way to classify them, and certain types of snakes prefer one type of movement to another. And this, this movement or this motion is classified on the basis of contact with the ground. So the classic sort of side-to-side -side serpentine motion, like the snake on the treadmill, Right? That's typically what we think of when we think of snakes, but there are some modifications of this, right? In the serpentine motion, you have multiple points of contact along a snake. In the case of a sidewinding motion, one to two parts of the snake are going to be in contact with the ground at any given time. So sidewinders are a rattlesnake that's found out in, in the west, in the dunes, and this is what they do. But a lot of species actually do this, um, primarily in sort of arid places. When snakes climb trees or climb walls like this, they'll use a concertina motion where they're basically increasing the contact in one place to secure their body and then they explore with their head and do kind of like an accordion motion up a wall or up a uh, tree bark. So if you have something where they can grab into a little bit like, you know, like the, the, the ridges of, of brick or you know, tree bark or something like that, then you can usually climb up things, right? But they're gonna have a hard time climbing up like a pane of glass, for example. And then uh, heavy-bodied snakes move with this very sort of slow rectilinear motion where their scales are basically, their ventral scales, which are enlarged, are basically moving them forward, right? So if you think about this really thick gaboon viper and how it's moving, or if you think about a python or a boa, how they move, rectilinear motion is what they're using. So just one more fascinating way to classify snakes. So when we look at the groups as a whole, you're gonna see a lot of modifications of the skull and the jaw. So when you look at the Tuatara, the Tuatara in many ways represents what diaps diapsids are supposed to look like. A large orbital opening on their skull and then two smaller temporal fenestrations that are bright and open, right? So that's probably what some of the Permian reptiles would have displayed, and Tuataras continue to display this. When you look at modern lizards, quote unquote, you're seeing selection favor a skull that's more uh, flexible, more able to move around, in exhibit increased kinesis. Those bones become reduced, the holes become bigger. In the case of lizards, you start to see the development of an arch. And this arch is essentially the meeting of three bones, the quadrate, 
the postorbital bone, and the squamate bone. And as these start to, 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 to sort of elongate, you start seeing this, this arch develop. By the time you get to snakes, they've lost these arches entirely. They're still considered squamates just because of their evolutionary history, but those same bones have now been preoccupied. So as you look here, you're seeing the, the PO and the SQ and the QJ bone. They're moving into different parts. Same bone, but they're being used for different purposes. Snakes have lost that arch. Instead, that quadrate bone is now connecting the, the back part of their jaw with their, the rest of their skull, which has been reduced entirely. And now you're getting a more flexible jaw because now you have um, uh, tendons and ligaments that are holding on to, or ligaments, not tendons, that are now sort of making the jaw more flexible, able to stretch. And that's essentially representative of what a snake does, right? Eating things that are often bigger than its mouth. So it's able to expand its jaw and consume. The total other direction, amphisbionids, they've gone ahead and essentially made their jaw as, or they've made their skull as immobile as possible. Instead, favoring a very ossified skull where everything is fused. So they don't, they're not able to open their mouth uh, as widely as other creatures because they have, you know, very little limited motion, which makes sense for them because they're living underground and using their heads to move dirt through. So you need to have a strong head, so to speak. So it's interesting to follow this through time. Now, in the case of snakes, in addition to the skull, you have differences in the teeth. So tooth placement in them in snakes is also characteristic uh, that can be used to define a snake and figure out its roles. Now, when we think of snakes, we think of fangs. And when we think of fangs, we almost always think of fangs that can pop out, that are really, really long, and that deliver venom. What we're really thinking about are these selenoglymphous type of retractable fangs that are really, really large. So that's the third one down. And these would be the type of fangs that you would find on a viper or on a rattlesnake that's able to fold its fangs and retract them so that it's not biting itself uh, and able to expand them and even to the point where they can stick out of the skull entirely when they're biting something that's large. So vipers have that kind of fate, that kind of fang placement. Now cobras are also very dangerous, right? But they have fangs that are much, much smaller. They have the proteroglyphous type of fangs that are rigid. They don't expand. They fit into sockets on the lower jaw, uh, but they do still deliver venom, obviously. So much smaller fangs that don't retract. You also have another type of snake uh, Apistophytoglyphus and Apistophytoglyphus uh, snakes are what we call rear fang snakes. So they kind of pop in different places. Uh, if you think about coral snakes here in the United States that are also venomous snakes, they're rear fanged. Uh, and you know, I myself have been bitten by a rear fang snake, a mangrove snake, when I was in Vietnam in a place called Pang Nung Mang uh, National Park on the border with Laos. Uh, and that put me out of commission for a good week. That rear fangs, uh, rear fang snakes are, usually we think of them in this picture here, you can see those rear fangs. They tend to be kind of retractable, but they're in the back of the jaw. And we think of them as being less dangerous. It's not necessarily the case, um, but rear fang snakes, uh, usually in order to be able to successfully deliver venom they have to be biting into something that's fairly small that fits all the way back in the jaw because they can't hit something larger than them so unless you're sticking your finger inside of the mouth of a coral snake you shouldn't be getting envenomated by coral snakes and if you are doing that then you're frankly gonna gonna get what you deserve so those are the kind of snakes that fit those descriptions. I want to remind everybody that unless you're delivering venom, you don't necessarily need particularly the long fangs. So most snakes are a glyphus, meaning that they lack fangs. Glyphus meaning fangs. So most non-venomous snakes are going to be a glyphus because they don't have to deliver venom like that. They rely on constriction or something like that. So snake teeth are pretty interesting in and of themselves. So let's talk about venom. 
<clears throat> venom is delivered, is produced uh, and synthesized and stored in a venom gland located in the head. And the venom gland is usually um, surrounded by muscles, compressor muscles, and these are under the control of the sympathetic nervous system. So when an animal is scared or excited, those muscles will contract and shoot that venom through a specialized duct. That duct is lined with, um, with an impermeable epithelial membrane that prevents that venom from going into the snake itself. So as it makes its way through the duct, it'll enter the venom canal and be delivered out through the fangs. So here is a gaboon viper. They've got the longest fangs out there, about two inches. A gaboon viper is in Central Africa. It's a sit and wait predator. They stay in one spot, sometimes an entire year. It's crazy. Venom is usually a term we use to describe a whole bunch of different things that are present in fluid form. And they are usually proteins and other things, but usually some sort of proteins a whole bunch of them that are essentially blocking receptors, blocking enzymes, or stimulating receptors and stimulating enzymes. And the idea is that they're basically swamping your body with inhibitors and blockers and stimulators and, and, and mimics for stuff that you already have, uh, causing your body to engage in natural reactions that are runaway, essentially. So two types. You have basically your neurotoxins. These are the ones that are geared towards affecting your nervous system, right? And these are usually the ones that act a lot faster. So when you hear about you only have, you know, two hours to live after getting bit, it's probably a neurotoxin that's going to get you. And then you also have uh, hemorrhagins or hemorrhagic toxins that basically act by inducing necrosis, basically tissue death. And they start to cause the apoptosis of cells inside of your body. And they also have mechanisms for basically preventing the clotting of blood, meaning that they're going to circulate everywhere. I want to point out, some snakes will specialize in one type of venom over another type of venom. But most snakes can do both to a certain degree. So the bottom line is that you don't, you can't say... Neurotoxins belong to this group of snakes. Hemorrhages belong to that group of snakes because the reality is that there's a good mix. Venom is also not something that's confined to snakes. Obviously, we know about other things. There's also lizards that are venomous, and there's two species that are living today that are also venomous, that are classically venomous. There are some other kind of versions. Anybody know what those are? Well, they're both found in this part of the world. One of them is in the U.S., the Gila monster. So the Gila monster is a venomous animal that when it bites, it hangs on like a bulldog. And then its closest relative is the bearded lizard, which is, or beaded lizard, sorry, not bearded, beaded lizard, uh, which is found in, in Mexico. Again, similar kind of environment, arid. Uh, they both have very colorful, aposmatic coloration that basically tells animals, hey, I'm colorful with these bold patterns, leave me alone, I can hurt you. So reproduction in squamates, uh, in internal fertilization is what happens. Uh, you have a mix of both oviparity as well as viviparity. Uh, oviparity is probably the ancestral condition, which makes sense considering amniotes, right? But there's also viviparity, which has evolved many, 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 many times. Uh, so live birth or egg birth, they, they're capable of both when you look at the whole group of squamates. Uh, they can also exhibit parthenogenesis. So what is parthenogenesis? Well, parthenogenesis means, and I quote, virgin birth. The idea is that there are squamates out there where they're capable of 
reproducing and producing successful offspring that could reproduce themselves uh, without having to be fertilized, at least maybe not in the classical sense. And there's two main types we can identify here. There's the obligate parthenogenesis and then there's facultative parthenogenesis. In the case of obligate parthenogenesis, this comes from uh, studies that were done uh, way back in the day in the 80s where this researcher was studying New Mexico whiptail lizards, which are the lizards shown up here. And in his studies in New Mexico, what he found was that all of the lizards he would catch are female. They were female, no exceptions. They were always female, had female reproductive traits, female reproductive anatomy. Everything was female. So later on, when they did the genetics on this, they found that the females um, were all triploid, meaning, you know, how your haploid, your gametes are going to be haploid and they fuse together and they produce a full, you know, a full individual that's diploid with the full complement of uh, reproductive or full complement of chromosomes and genetic material. Well, what he found was that the lizards were triploid and that the daughters would always be clones of mom. And even hybrids, right? Uh, when he would hybridize around the groups and, and, you know, do that, he would find that they would always be clones, full clones of mom. So that's an example of obligatory parthenogenesis where all individuals are engaging in this virgin birth. Now, the way it worked is even though they're capable of having offspring without fertilization that can you know, develop, they still need the behaviors to trigger the thing. So as ovaries develop, you see, the, you, know, you see all the reproductive behaviors follow, and at ovulation, the reproductive behaviors would culminate in mating. So he would still see mating lizards out there, but when he sampled them, what he found was they were all female. So basically, as the story goes, older females retain female-like traits, but younger females, under the control of progesterone, would engage in male-like reproductive behaviors. So they would mount the female, and in doing so, they induce ovulation, which causes uh, development to happen. So there's no fertilization here, they're just a clone. The, ov the ovulation results in eggs that are clones of mom, but they're the ovulation act the uh, the the ovulation process is initiated by the behavior of male-like females and they would do this at regular intervals and that's when reproduction would occur so it would be under the behavioral control in this case it would be induced by by the reproductive the mating behavior so it was a very interesting observation there and it was the first time parthenogenesis was described in a vertebrate it's not the last, and we're finding that it's more and more common. Facultative parthenogenesis is when you have species that are normally engaging in sexual reproduction, but will engage in asexual reproduction when the conditions arise. So you hear about this sort of thing all the time uh, with captive animals, where you have, uh, you know, it happened most recently with, um, I know it's happened with pythons in captivity and boas, it's also happened with a Komodo dragon recently. I believe it was in the Berlin Zoo. This Komodo dragon, uh, since birth, has been kept by itself uh, and has never encountered another Komodo dragon or has never encountered a male Komodo dragon. And then one day, the zookeepers in the Berlin Zoo discovered that this Komodo dragon was about to give birth. And they were like, how is this possible? It's never even encountered another Komodo dragon. How is this possible? Well, what happens is during eugenesis, you have the, 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 the haploid egg will sometimes fuse with one of the polar bodies. And when that happens, the polar body is basically a, um, it's, you know, during meiosis, it's the, you know, three of the four cells don't develop and they just become these small little polar bodies. But if they were to fuse back with the, the egg, it would produce a diploid organism that has got the full range of, of traits, and thus producing a half clone of mom, if you will. So that's what would happen. And this would happen spontaneously, we don't quite understand how it works, but it's been, it's occurred in a lot of different species. So 
that's reproduction, the most interesting parts of reproduction. Other than that, most of the time it's pretty straightforward. Reptiles are not known, and Lepidosaurs especially, are not known for their extensive parental care. However, there is some parental care in some species. So what might that involve? There's a picture of it right here. This is a children's python. It's one of the ones that my, my friend Zach Stalschmidt, um, we shared the world's smallest office back in grad school days at ASU. He was studying these children's pythons and their parental behavior. And their parental behavior was basically they wrap themselves around the eggs and stay there and, and protect the eggs until they're born. Then they leave. So that's usually what we're talking about. When we talk about snakes and lizards, parental care is essentially location, right? Where to put the nest, taking some care into, into making that decision, and then protecting the, the eggs. But they don't all do that. So one last thing I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is that you can live in a place and have a high diversity of species that otherwise look very similar. And this is because they've learned to partition habitat uh, and the niches in the habitat in a particular way that minimizes conflict between species. And over time, you're going to see evolution favor particular traits in each type. So the classic example of this are the anoles, which exhibit these ecomorphs. Anoles are found throughout the Caribbean. They're obviously found here. The brown ones here are, are from Cuba and the Bahamas. We have a green anole as well. But these introduced brown anoles uh, have sort of taken over things. But if you go into the Caribbean, each Caribbean island has an assemblage of anoles. So each island has five or six species of anoles at least. So how can that be? How could each of these islands have this many? Well, when you look at anoles, you see some very interesting sort of um, traits associated with where that anole lives. Anoles that inhabit the upper canopies tend to be larger. They tend to almost look like iguanas. Then you have anoles that inhabit the trunk of a tree. Those tend to be like these brown anoles, kind of smaller, a little more stocky, but very visible. And then you have some very hidden ones that are often found in uh, bushes and sort of out of the way more dense vegetation twigs stuff like that right and they tend to be smaller slender less noticeable and each of these have a dewlap right anoles are distinguished by this dewlap which is uh, you know colorful you've seen the lizards do this they use it for displays so each of these ecomorphs are going to be inhabiting a particular place and in each island, there's a different set of species, each with these particular characteristics, depending on where they live. So in Puerto Rico, for example, you'll have a trunk ground anole, and you have a twig anole, and you have a crowned giant anole. And then in the next island over, in, the, in Hispaniola, in the Dominican Republic, and in Haiti, you'll have the same type of anoles, but they're going to look pretty similar, but they're going to still be different. And one thing that's different is that dewlap, right? That's a way to tell the species apart. So here's pictures of the dewlaps, and below are some graphs showing air, the blue line goes up and down every time they expand their dewlap. So it kind of gives you an idea of the signal. So what's the point of this dewlap? You've seen it before. What are they doing? What are they trying to say? Well, there's three main things. One, territory. This is my place, stay away. So they're communicating that visually. You know, through the coloration of the dewlap, the size of the dewlap, and the display. The second thing is they're obviously males have the dewlap, females don't have the dewlap as pronounced, so males are probably using it to communicate to females about reproduction, about hey look at me, I'm nice, I got this nice habitat here, look at my territory, I'm living large. Right, you want to get with me. And then the third thing is, especially in places where there's a lot of species, the differences in the colors and the differences in the pattern with which they, these dewlaps are shown allows species to tell each other apart. So it, it provides species recognition. So there you go. Anoles, interesting. If you like them, talk to me because I study them. I study them around here. More than happy to take on students to do that. But now it's time for everybody's favorite thing, the Florida Lepidosaur Quiz. And let's start with our first.
Name these lizards. Well, they got a little bit of a fat body. They tend to be on logs or underneath them. These are skinks. Specifically, these are the broad-headed skinks. And broad-headed skinks, uh, along with other skinks, tend to be one of the few lizards where you can tell males from females. So in the foreground is the male. You can see some of the stripes on them. And on the female is a little bit larger. Her head is actually a little bit broader. Uh, and that's the female. So here's a male encountering a female. Boy meets girl on top of a log. It's a love story, right? Ready to happen right there. All right, moving on. Our next lepidosaur is a snake. What is that? Well, there's coloration differences between males and females. There's also coloration differences with age. You can tell right away the head is kind of triangular. Obviously, it's got the forked tongue, but that, that triangular head and thinner body should tell you that this is a, a viper, something you probably want to stay away from. The bright colors of this animal, it, it ends in this little yellow tail. This is a baby cottonmouth. So a baby cottonmouth looks like this. As they get older, they put more melanin in their skin. They start to look a little bit darker and drabber, right? But when they're young, they're, they're vibrant with this sort of reddish brown color. So be wary. What is this lepidosaur, this lizard? Well, you're probably thinking anole, and you would be correct. However, if you're thinking brown anole, it's not quite there. Uh, Florida actually has more species of, of invasive lizards than it does native lizards, and anoles are no exception, especially as you go further south. The brown anole, you start to see this other anole that has this crest on its back. The brown anoles are originally from Cuba, and from the Bahamas, some of the Bahamian islands, that's where the brown anole that we know that lives on campus is from. As you go further south, you start to see this one with more of a crest. These are the, the crested anoles from Puerto Rico. Basically the brown anole versions over there. So that little crest on its back gives it away. They also have essentially the colors reversed. It's yellow with, with orange around the edges for their dewlap. Moving on, another snake. Well, this is a cool snake. It's the green snake. Go figure. Specifically, the rough green snake. And the reason they call it the rough green snake is because there's a smooth green snake. The difference being that the rough green snake has um, a small little line on each of its scales, making it uh, what they call keeled scales, as opposed to the smooth scales of the smooth green snake. But this is a snake that's uh, really gone, undergone real sharp declines, but it's a very beautiful snake. It's Pretty common if you look around some of the right forests in central Florida. So moving on, name this thing. Well, very reduced eye, annulate scales, Sort of a shovel face, if you will, wedge-shaped skull, probably a kinetic. This is an amphisbionid. This is the Florida worm lizard. So it's one of them. It's one of the ones with the tube body. Uh, and they're, they're actually quite common. When people see them, they, they always freak out and they always think it's an earthworm. And they have a bad habit of killing them, which I never understood. But I think they're fascinating and they don't really bite. So you can just pick them up and they're fine. Um, I used to see them a lot when there would be rains, and after rain I would go for a jog in the morning, the, the following day, and I would see these things. So, here's a lizard. What lizard is this?
So anoles aren't the only lizards we have. This is a race runner, specifically a six-lined race runner. They're a ground lizard that likes open habitats and they run around and if you if you go into the woods and you keep an eye out, you can usually see them. They're pretty common. All right, one last Lepidosaur. Look at that hair. Look at that hair, people. Well, it's kind of hard to tell because it is a bit of a distance. But I am using a snake hook, which should be your first clue. It's something dangerous. Uh, that's a copperhead. So copperheads are, again, a, a viper. They tend to, they're more of a North Florida than South Florida type thing. In Central Florida, you get a few here and there. But uh, they're a forest version of the copperhead, of the cottonmouth, basically. So they look this way because they blend into leaf litter really well, and they're kind of hard to see. Uh, but unless you're actively looking for them, you're probably not going to even encounter them, to be honest with you. But they're really pretty. I think they're one of my favorite snakes in, in North America. So following that, Carl Sagan highlighted something that's very obvious, but needs to be repeated over and over again. Most of the species that have been around on this planet are now gone. Just like most of the people that have been around on this planet are now gone. Extinction is the rule. It has always been the rule in nature. And survival is the exception. So when you look at something and you can see it with your own two eyes, I want you to remember that that individual, that creature, that organism, that lineage is a survivor. And of course you can see what our topic is going to be next week, which should come as no surprise. It was inevitable we were going to get to that. So without further ado, I will see you next time.